So I feel like I need to let people know what exactly happened with the diatribe and our ARPA proposal, because now I feel like the county commission, as well as media outlets, are trying to sweep everything under the rug and not really talk about how egregious what happened was. Um, so the ARPA process in itself is a wildly extensive and thorough process. And honestly, I have to give my credit to Kent County because they did it better than most cities across America, counties across America. Um, their process was so much more thorough uh, and hands-on than places like the city of Detroit. Uh, so I just want to really take my hat off to Kent County for their entire process. Uh, the way that they designed this process, and part of the reason this was so egregious, is they designed it to be as non-political and unbiased as possible. There were three steps to this process. The first step of the process, they hired an unbiased consultant. This unbiased consultant went through all 319 ARPA proposals and gave them a yellow, green, or red score. Green being the best, yellow being the middle of the road, red being this project is doo doo. Uh, and they graded these projects on three different categories. Uh, they also gave them a grade on community impact. Uh, so there's four different areas that these projects were graded on. The diatribe was one of very few projects that received an all green rating from these consultants. One of very few. Uh, the second step of this project was all of the county commissioners came together and anonymously they voted on the projects that they liked. So they all got clickers and then gave projects a score of one to five, one being that's terrible, five being this project is groundbreaking, and they all used their clickers to, to vote on the projects. And the diatribe finished in like the top 20% of these projects. Uh, it got support from 12 or 13 out of the 19 county commissioners. So step two, it got support from a majority of the county commissioners. Step three, the county administrator then went through everything that the consultant said, went through everything that the county commissioners voted on, and was listening to everything that the public had been saying over the last years, and submitted 29 projects for funding. The diatribe was one of those 29 projects that the Kent County administrative team put forth to the commissioners and suggested for funding. We were one of 29. We were the number 12 ranked proposal out of 319 applicants. We were ranked 12. Mind you, this project isn't only an arts and culture center. It's gonna have truly affordable housing on the upstairs. So like places that are like half of market rate, we're talking like $600 a month for a studio, $800 a month for a two bedroom. We're gonna give people money back after three years so they can use that as a down payment uh, to, to be more competitive in the housing market. So we're flipping the idea of affordable housing and equity when it comes to rental systems on their heads. The half of the building is gonna be hyper affordable retail fronts so that we can make our business district, Burton Heights, more walkable. Uh, it's one of the least invested in business districts in the entire city. And then we're also gonna have a collaborative working space and a youth programmatic space. Uh, so this building is gonna be open at all hours of the day. And then the basement of this building, we're doing an all ages venue. Uh, and we plan on bringing in some of the most prolific writers, speakers, and change makers from all across the country. Uh, so this business, uh, this building, this entity, uh, it symbolizes so much of what citizens have been saying they wanted. It would also be somewhere where people can live, work, and play in our neighborhood. Um, and something that, again, combats a ton of systems which are fueled by, you know, some of our city's elite. You know, there's a few hands that have their hands on a lot of money. So a week, not even a week, after our project was submitted by the Kent County Administrator, I get a call from a county commissioner and he says to me, you know, hey, Marcel, uh, the people on one side of the aisle, you know, they're, they're really not fans of your guys' organization. Uh, they think that you guys are Black Lives Matter. They think that you guys are defund the police. 
they basically think that you guys are the people who bring drag queens into classrooms. That's what he said verbatim. Um, he was like, I don't know, it's gonna be really hard to convince them, but I think that we can do it, you know, it's just gonna take some negotiating. Uh, but I just wanna let you know that, you know, you might wanna be really careful of what exists on your website and social media because they're really gonna be trying to pick through everything to find a reason not to fund you. And at that point, I was panicking. Um, I, I let that panic sit. Uh, I've talked to a lot of people that I know in the administrator's office to say, hey, you know, is somebody going to mess up this project? Everybody on the administrative side and different people that I know in community were all like, we're hearing nothing but great things about this project. Like, this is going to be historic. Um, and then the week of Thanksgiving comes and a different county commissioner calls me and he says, hey, man, uh, these people do not want to fund you. Is there any way that you think that you could get a local foundation to receive this money under, let's say, uh, an arts and culture project, and then they would give you the money? And I was like, I, I think that I might be able to do that. But like, do you understand how gross it feels? Like, I guarantee you, you're not doing this with anybody else. Like, this is only us. And he's like, yeah, man, I know, I'm really sorry. And I was like, well, I, I, I'm sure that I could do it. But again, like with foundations, these are big entities. You can't just flip a switch and have them like, they have to run it up the, their boards, uh, trustees, like that's not a quick process. And he's like, well, I'm just, I'm just trying to find solutions because what they're scared about is they're scared if they vote yes to fund you, that people on their side of the aisle are going to push them out of office next term that has been threatened to them that that's what's going to happen. And I was like, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll ask. And he's like, well, don't rush things yet. You know, I'll get back with you after the holiday and, and let you know what the best next steps are. And I was like, okay, great. So all Thanksgiving, I'm, I'm miserable. Uh, it's my first Thanksgiving without Nika. Um, so it was already hard, but now I'm just racking my brain about these people are going to stop something that we've been working our entire lives for and that we built from what community said that they wanted to see. Uh, I get a call uh, the day before the county commission meeting and the county commissioner that calls me says, hey man, these people do not want to budge on allowing your project to get funded. Uh, so I want to know would you be okay with a straight up and down vote? And I was like, I don't know what this means, man. I'm not a politician. Can you, can you explain to me in layman's terms like what this means? And he's like, well, we'd bring your project up for a vote and then everyone can vote. If you can sway some of these, you know, people on one side of the aisle, then, you know, you might get the votes because I'm pretty sure the people on our side of the aisle, you know, they're all gonna vote with you. So you'd really just need to sway like two people. Um, and then you'd have the numbers and it would get passed. And I was like, if that's our only opportunity, man, like, yeah, I want to do that. Like doing that sounds better than, you know, just getting the proposal taken off when we don't deserve it. And he's like, all right, man, well, that's what we're going to do. And I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, and I was like, okay, man. So, you know, I, I jump on social media. I talk to our social media team. I'm like, hey, everybody write in letters to your, your county commissioners, to the admin office. Hey, if you can come tomorrow for public comment, please come speak, come talk about how the diatribe has impacted your life as an individual. Um, there were so many people that wrote in letters, like former students everywhere from like Caledonia to Union to Northview, um, the Ottawa Hills wrote in letters, teachers, administrators, business owners, corrections officers, like I'm saying people all on all sides of the aisle uh, wrote in letters. I think there's close to 50 letters in total um, that ended up getting submitted the day before and the day of. Um, and I walked in that day, you know, really thinking, you know, this is my one opportunity to convince these people to turn this project into a reality. Uh, and I was, I was sick to my stomach. You know, I was nervous. I was so terrified and I normally don't get nervous to speak, but I was, you know, I was really scared. I was like, if I say something wrong, you know, these people already think of me one type of way. I, I, I need to really articulate myself if I'm going to convince them to, to be in favor of this project. And I sit down and a county commissioner walks up to me and he's like, Hey man, I'm sorry. 
I just want to let you know that there's not going to be a vote today. And I was like, wait, what? What do you what do you mean? Like, I got all these people to send in letters. I have people here for public comment because you literally told me there was going to be a vote today. And he's like, yeah, man, they just they wouldn't they wouldn't allow it. So we ended up putting money towards another proposal. But the good news is, is it's, it's, you know, it's a black organization. Um, so, you know, that's, that's good. Um, and everyone around me was there thinking that they were going to speak to sway these people. All these people wrote in letters thinking that they were going to have the opportunity to sway these people. And at the end of the day, they took us off this docket without us even having a chance. Um, they didn't tell us in the beginning to write all of these county commissioners and to sway them through the process. Uh, they didn't tell us to get everybody hitting up these commissioners uh, early in the process. And I think the, the part that hurts the most, honestly, is pr there were projects that were funded that were graded red by these consultants. There were projects that were funded that weren't even voted on highly by the county commissioners. There was one project that got a half a million dollars and the head of the project went to school with one of the county commissioners. What kind of privilege do you need to have to fall backwards into a half a million dollars, you know? And there, there was another project, they were given four million dollars and it wasn't even the proposal that they put in. They put in a proposal for one thing and then received $4 million for something else. There was another two proposals that are bankrolled by some of the wealthiest people in all of Michigan, definitely Grand Rapids, and they were given over $6 million for their two projects. And these people are billionaires, you know? These people are, are rich. And this money was supposed to be used to even out the adverse effects that COVID had on the people who were most impacted by the COVID pandemic. Um, and those communities are our neighborhoods. Those communities are our neighbors. Those communities are predominantly city areas where a lot of people are sitting on top of one another. And there were projects that got funded that were like, the Rockford Library got $2 million. Libraries are normally funded through millages. The city of Rockford is well off. And our project that was ranked 12 overall out of 319 didn't get funded because people on one side of the aisle were convinced if they voted for us that they would get primary in the next election meaning to, to everyday extraordinary human beings like me who before I knew what I knew about politics. What that means is we just passed this election cycle, right? Everybody saw these commercials. Hillary Skolton uh, was riding with the people who were rioting downtown. Don't vote for her. That's what getting like people trying to primary you is. It, it, would, it would be people saying, oh, well, this person voted for the diatribe. So he's with bringing drag queens into classrooms. This person voted for the diatribe, so he's with defund the GRPD, right? When our organization had nothing to do with all of those things. But yet now we can't do what we were going to do in community for our neighborhood, for the people that we serve, with a track record of constantly doing, constantly doing well. When we got money from the CARES Act, we spent it, spent it well, spent it intentionally. I think 80% of those dollars went, went, to, went to black, brown, queer, women-owned businesses. Again, intentional with every dollar and showed that we're good stewards with the county's money as well as the foundation's money. And still, we got held back from it. There's organizations that got funded that don't even have that financial track record that again, still got funded. And I was sitting down with a reporter and a news story just came out. And if you let these people tell the story, what they'll say is, you know, they got 320 applications. You can't fund them all. You know, there were, there were 290, 80 some organizations that didn't get funded. It wasn't 290 organizations that were in the top 12. <laughs> that's, that's not the case. And really the thing about the diatribe that makes us scary to them to so many other people 
is we don't just get buddy buddy and sit at these tables with the people who want to do us wrong. I'm so happy that these black organizations got money. You know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm like Issa Rae. I'm a cheer on everybody black no matter what, right? Um, but they like to fund the people that don't make them scared. They like to fund the people that don't make them worried. They like to fund the people that aren't gonna act up, right? That aren't gonna start a ruckus, right? Organizations like us, we're striving for liberation. We're not, we're not, we're not striving so, you know, 10 people can make it economically, you know, we're looking for collective liberation. How do we make it to where a neighborhood can move forward? How do we make it to where a business district can move forward? How do we make it to where our kids feel empowered to speak about what's around them? You know, they don't like that some of our kids did walkouts. They don't like it that some of our kids went viral for, for talking about their opinions and beliefs. But guess what? There were kids in their own district who are talking about their opinions and beliefs. They're talking about their struggles with mental health. They're talking about their struggles with suicide. They're talking about their struggles with domestic violence and molestation, you know? And, and now our organization is made to be some partisan tool for one side of the aisle to create outrage and the other side of the aisle to be too scared of to vote on. And this project has nothing to do with politics has to do with people and this these ARPA proposals they shouldn't have had to do with they shouldn't have had to do with politics they should have had to do with people once in a lifetime investments into the communities most disturbed by COVID so that we can do some things that we've never been able to do with this this once in a lifetime investment from the federal government and I think that if people really look into this process into who was funded into who was funded that wasn't given high rankings and who was funded this buddy buddy or went to school with some of these county commissioners, there is some egregious and possibly illegal activity that happened. Uh, more importantly, some unethical activity that happened. And I think that it's Gr Grand Rapids, this place that people know is economically not advantageous for black and brown people, is a black, brown, and queer ran organization. The fact that we can do everything right, that we can do their process right, do their process better than 280 some candidates, and they still move the basket out of reach while the ball is in the air. The fact that that is fair, the fact that they're acting like it's normal and it's nothing wrong, you know, that's what the issue with all of this is. And I want the people hearing this and seeing this to understand that this isn't the way that things are supposed to work. This isn't democracy, right? How are young innovators ever gonna come to the city and make this city a groundbreaking place, you know, if, if this is the way that these structures and systems work?